My name is Amir Sadegi, and I um, am the senior counsel of the Office of Defendant Advocate. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to like this group, I know already. <laughs> We're going to be talking about TOPA, which is the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Uh, show of hands, how many people know about TOPA already? Okay. All right, more specifically, we're going to talk about TOPA as it applies to single family dwellings. All right, so just a quick overview. Uh, basically, the TOPA law was created to protect tenants' rights to remain in their properties and to help tenants uh, purchase the units in which they live uh, in case those units were being sold. And the way TOPA worked before this change was for any unit, no matter what the size, if the owner of the unit decided to sell the unit, then the tenants had a right to purchase the unit or to assign that right to a third party. That law, effective July 3rd of this year, has been changed. So effective that day, if a landlord wants to sell a single family accommodation, these new laws apply. So, uh, show of hands, who believes they, they, they live in a single family accommodation? Okay. So, this might not apply to a lot of you. It, it still would be helpful for you to know. And we're hoping that uh, once you find out, you also help your fellow tenants know and understand these rules. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a great question. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. All right. So the property is affected. See, you're, you're getting ahead of me, because that's, that's what I'm getting at right now. We're talking about a single family accommodation. The definition is in that handout, but we'll just talk about it really quickly. It's just any structure that contains rooms uh, forming single uh, living space, uh, kitchen, and intended for living, li living, eating, sleeping. Basically, you're talking about if you've got a townhome, a row home, a single family home, um, a, a condo unit that's owned by one person, a separate condo unit, or any of those things are considered a single family accommodation. Now, the other thing that uh, is added to this single family is an accessory dwelling unit. And an accessory dwelling unit is a rental unit that is secondary to the principal single family accommodation, and, but has a you know, separate kitchen, it could have a separate bath, separate entrance, and uh, the most common example is you'll have a um, single family home and maybe in the backyard you'll have like a detached little second uh, unit, carriage house, that sort of thing. And in that scenario they both fall under the, S the single family dwelling category. All right. So let's go, uh, go over some examples to see what applies and what doesn't apply. The landlord ha uh, owns a condominium in a 24 unit condominium building in DuPont Circle. Show of hands, who thinks that that applies, that, that, that falls under the category of single family accommodation? Just one? Yes. All right, show of hands if you think it does not. Okay, why not? Because it's the whole building. Ah, false, false, false. Let me tell you why. The landlord owns just one condominium unit, right? See, the landlord owns a condominium unit in a 24 unit building. That's okay. That's okay. Listen, I'm here to trip you up any chance I get. All right? So, yeah? All right. All right. So they, they apply. I'll trip you up any chance I get. Tenants renting an entire row home in Navy Yard. Show of hands who thinks that falls under the category of single family accommodation. We just got some non-voters. Y'all got to get out and vote. <laughs> this is why we have these problems right now. People are not participating. All right, pilots of George Washington's Mount Vernon are renting a single carriage house unit. Does that fall under the category? Yes or no? Yes? See, y'all sleeping. Mount Vernon's on the other side of the river. That's in Virginia. I told you I'm here to trip you up. Exactly. That's not in D.C. Topo applies only to D.C. That's in Virginia. Okay? That was a trick question. That was a trick question. 
All right, Georgetown townhome divided into an upstairs and a basement unit, both of them being rented. Yes or no? Yes? All right, I got Kelly shaking her head back there. Sorry? It's exactly, it's different. That's a two unit property. That's a two unit property. That is not a single family accommodation. Yeah, because it's been divided up. Now, it, it's still deeded. Excuse me? No, it does not. An ADU is an accessory dwelling unit that's separate from the main dwelling unit. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, okay. So uh, you have this a lot where you have one building that's, that's owned by one person as one uh, fee simple uh, deeded property, but separated into different units. That is a multi-unit building. Okay? All right, guys. Now, this is going to be the... Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 No, that would be considered a two-unit. You, you, ha you have a lot of uh, brownstones that have... Uh, a basement, and then they have like a first floor unit, second floor unit, third floor unit, right? So in, in that scenario, if they're deeded, it, not, not even if they're deeded separately, it could be deeded all as one property, but if they're uh, c uh, considered different units and leased out separately, then that would be diff more than one unit. Now if it's all r uh, uh, rented out as a, under one lease agreement, then then it does fall under single family accommodation. But if it's leased out separately, then it's multiple units. Yes. 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 Well, think about it, ma'am. An apartment building, right? Let's say, so uh, Tom here lives at uh, 4,000 Mass Ave, and, and, and that's uh, an apartment building, over 440, 441? 441 units, right? So, uh, one company owns the entire building. It's deeded as one entity. But it's divided. Every floor has multiple different units. So that, that is different units. It's not a single unit building. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So if I, if I have my home and I'm renting upstairs and downstairs, and mm -hmm. they can have two units, yes. they can have one unit and I'm renting upstairs. Uh -huh. If I want to sell my home, yes. Topo don't apply to that? Well, Hold on. We're not saying TOPA does not apply right now. We're not talking about does TOPA apply. Right now we're saying what is a single family accommodation, okay? So if you're renting a property, right, and if you're renting, it's, it's one property, but it's got different floors, and it's, each floor is being rented as a separate unit, that's a multi-unit property. Okay, I have that too. Let me know my family, right? Okay, single family home. Yes. Okay. Flesh. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Are you living upstairs yourself? You're renting the upstairs as one unit, and you're renting the basement as a separate unit. That's a two-unit property. That falls under under a different category than, than what we're talking about. Okay. Yes, Tom. Uh, some months ago, when this was, the law was changed, the, the people who were trying to change the law, the, the landlord, were making all sorts of claims and quoting data that seemed crazy. Uh, would you identify as you go through? What would you like me to clarify? The arguments and that led to the change in the law. Sure. And whether or not there was just downright All right. Now, look, that's a fair point, and I understand what you're saying. Um, I, that was not intended to be part of this session. This session was just to be an FYI. It was intended to be uh, passing on information about what the new law is, not why or how the new law was created. Um, so.
frankly, I, I just didn't bring that information because I was not intended to be part of this session. I think uh, your question is very relevant, and I think there should be a discussion about that, and maybe we'll have that at, at one, of, one of our upcoming stakeholder meetings. We just can't do it right now. Yes, sir. Yes. No, it's not illegal. Yes. No, but it, so look, um, you. Let's say you come in, right? You you go in, and there's there's like a a, a door to the, the 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 main first floor, right? And there's a separate door to the basement, right? Um, and, and and forget about sort of dividing it up. Let's just say the whole upstairs is one unit, and then. The basement is a separate unit. But there's nothing illegal about that. It happens all the time. A lot, of t a lot of people live in the upstairs and they rent out the basement, right? And by, you know, so that would fall under a single family because you're only renting out the basement. You're living in the rest. But if you're renting out one unit and then renting out a separate unit, that's legal. Hey, we're not talking about taxes. We're just talking about TOPA here. Okay, yes. All right, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right, so right now we're just saying this is what falls under the category of a single family accommodation. Y'all are getting way ahead of me. Uh, yes, this is a single family dwelling. Yes, single family. This is in Virginia. And no, this is not. Okay, so true, false, a true, true trick question, false. Okay? Yes. That's a different story. Come talk to me afterwards. No. Talk to me afterwards. It doesn't apply to this. But I'm here. Come talk to me. All right. So, now, notices need to be sent out. This is, this is the part where I really need your focus because this can get a little confusing, all right? The law requires two separate notices to be sent out. This is the first one. Within three calendar days of either soliciting or receiving in writing an offer to purchase a single family accommodation, an owner who has intent to sell has to deliver written notice of the offer to all the tenants, okay? So that's the first, first notice that has to be sent out. Now, why is intent to sell underlined? Because if I go up to Tom and I say, hey, Tom, uh, you know, I want to buy your, your house, and he doesn't have an intent to sell, he doesn't have to do anything. He does not have to provide uh, a, a TOPA notice. But if I go up to him and he says, oh, you know what? Yeah, I do want to sell it, then he does have to notify the tenant. Or if he puts it on the market, hires an agent, and says, I want to sell it. Within three days of that action, he has to notify the tenant. And the purpose of notification is just so the tenants know, hey, the property is being sold, and now I can participate in the purchase if I'm interested, right? Uh, regardless of whether TOPO applies to you, anybody can try to participate in the purchase. Uh, a couple of things that are relevant to this. The notice is good for one year, so if you've sent it out, you don't have to resend it out for every uh, further occasion unless new tenants move in. A civil action against the owner is the only remedy. And, and by that I mean that if, if they didn't send that notice out, you're not allowed to stop the sale. You're not allowed to file a lease pendants, which essentially just puts a lien on the property sort of and, and, and prevents the sale from happening. And you don't have any t uh, TOPA Title V remedies or other remedies preventing the sale. All right? This is what we'll refer to as the solicitation notice. And it just means, hey, I'm giving you notice. There's been a solicitation to sell the property. Okay. There's a second notice, and we're going to refer to this as the status inquiry notice. This is the notice of intent to sell, demolish, or discontinue the use as a rental housing. And the purpose is to determine whether a tenant claims elderly or disability status. All right? Why elderly or disability status? 
We'll get to that in a minute, but basically because that's what it takes for you not to be able to be eligible to receive TOPA rights in a single family accommodation. All right? So. It's just basically. Is that desirable, undesirable from a, a resident's or voter's standpoint? Is that, is that excessive or unreasonable or how? I know it is, but how would you characterize that? This? Uh, <coughs> that is a great question. I. I, I I, 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 I look at it pretty neutrally. I don't consider it excessive. And the reason is this. This solicitation notice, uh, it, it's just an FYI. Right? Hey, by the way, I'm selling the property. If you don't get it, you, you don't lose any tenant rights. Okay? Uh, so that's why I, you know, I don't think that this is, this is too harsh of a, a, a restriction. The other notice has to be sent out if there is a tenant who uh, is either elderly or, or has a disability, so it's eligible for TOPA. So if the other one's not sent out, then they have violated TOPA, and there are TOPA remedies, and Title V remedies, Lisbon, all of those things do apply to the other one, right? So the, there are safeguards here to make sure that tenants' rights are protected, okay? So Status inquiry notice. Again, landlord has to send, it has to be sent to the tenant and the officer tenant advocate on the same day. Um, and it can be combined with a previous notice, a solicitation notice. And look, you've got this DACD form one. Almost every single transaction that we've seen so far, it's just the form one. And it combines the status inquiry notice and the previous notice, that uh, solicitation notice. The HCD has decided they're going to combine these two forms. All right, so here's what that means to you. All right. Within 20 days of receiving that form one, you have to respond to the owner, okay? You have to respond to the owner and if you are claiming elderly status or disability status. If you don't respond within 20 days, you may waive your token rights, okay? Now, this applies even if you've already filed for status as an elderly tenant or a tenant with a disability. So even if you've, you've already applied, you still have to respond within 20 days of receiving that Form 1. And your response is with Form 2. So you, you get a Form 1, you respond with Form 2, and say, you say, yes, I'm claiming status as an elderly tenant or a tenant with a disability. OK, so then what happens? We have to provide documentation. And you have to provide documentation either of age with uh, you know, this information that's also in the form, so I'm not going to go over it, or of disability status. And you have to provide the documentation to DHCD, not the owner. Now, <clears throat> who's eligible for TOPA? A tenant who is elderly or has a disability is entitled to receive an offer of sale if the tenant signed a written lease on or before March 31, 2018, and the tenant took occupancy on or before April 15th, 2018. All right, so this is what it takes to be eligible for TOPA rights if you live in a single family accommodation. You either have to be an elderly tenant, which is a tenant over the age of 62, or you have to have a, a certified a documented disability. And if, and if you meet that criteria, you also have to have a written lease. You have to have signed up before March 31st, and you have to move them before April 15th. Yes? Um, most people have family leaves, and the lease usually gets one year on. Right. I'll, I'll answer that. So the question is, what if I have a lease, but I signed the lease a long time ago, and I didn't renew the lease? Uh, so what happens in D.C. is once your initial lease term expires, you automatically go to month to month. The terms of the lease agreement continue to remain in effect. The only thing that changes is your rent level. So they can increase your rent annually, but though that lease still applies unless you sign a new one or for some reason it becomes ineffective. Okay? 
So uh, if you signed one a long time ago, it's still valid. Yes, sir. So those dates are permanent or every year? Like They're permanent. They're permanent. So everybody after this date is in bad shape? They, 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 yeah, they just don't qualify for TOEFL okay. if they live in a single family accommodation. Okay. No. So if you're an elderly person, for example, and you move into a single family accommodation now, you don't, you're not eligible for TOEFL. You don't get TOEFL rights if that unit is sold. So that's what that means. If I understand correctly from the previous even if a person already has registered as disabled mm -hmm. or, or elderly, he's got to recertify essentially through this process? The recertification may not be necessary. And that's one of those things because it's a new law, we're still trying to work that out. You have to notify the owner if they submit that. So you have to sort of claim that status. but. If you contact DHCD and they already have your documentation on file, they may not require it again. Okay. Now, we tell everybody to do it because it's not clear in the law whether this applies to previous um, certifications. Uh, but it may not be the case. We're, we're just, out of an abundance of caution, we're saying, even if you've already done it, just do it again. Okay? All right. Now. The TOEFL process itself, let's say you are eligible to receive TOEFL rights. What does that really mean? It means that the owner has to send you an offer of sale to all eligible tenants and to the Office of Tenant Advocate on the same day. On the same day, they have to send it so that we get it so that, uh, because what we do is we send out uh, rapid response letters and, and, and they're, they're essentially letters to tenants uh, giving them uh, a head, heads up, this is, this is happening, uh, you, you, the, the property that uh, you're renting is being sold, and if you've got any questions, reach out to us. Okay? So that's why they're supposed to send it to us as well. You have 20 days from receipt of the offer of sale to deliver to the landlord a statement of interest. Now, the offer of sale is Form 3. Now, we talked about Form 1, which is that initial notice. We talked about Form 2, which is the response to that notice. Forms 3 and 4 are the offer of sale and the statement of interest. So there, there's a sort of parallel here. Forms 1 and 2 and Forms 3 and 4. Once you send in the, offer of, uh, the statement of interest and you essentially signify to your landlord that you're interested in purchasing or uh, interested in uh, entering into negotiations or, or, or uh, exercising your TOPA rights, that begins the negotiations period. And the negotiations period for new single family dwellings are 25 days. It's 25 days. So that means you have 25 days to come to an agreement to work out a contract or to assign your rights. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. No, it doesn't have to be certified now. I'm sorry? I mean, if, if you have any doubts about them saying that they received it, send it certified now. The, the law just doesn't require it. OK? You, I mean, you, you may also want to do hand delivery. That way, there's no doubt you can, you know, but that's up to you. Yes, you had a question. No? OK, perfect. All right, so you, you have a 25-day negotiation period. After this 25-day negotiation period runs out, or uh, I guess once you sign a contract with the landlord, there's an additional 45-day settlement period or financing period. And the purpose of that 45-day period is, uh, let's say you do come to an agreement with your landlord uh, to buy the property, you have that additional 45 days to obtain financing, to get a mortgage. Now, that 45 days can be extended up to 75 days if uh, you get a letter from a lender saying, hey, we need additional time to provide this mortgage. OK. So assignment. Right? Previously, anybody who got a TOEFL offer of sale was able to assign their TOEFL rights to somebody else. Right? And in exchange for assigning their rights, they could get any consideration that they, they would want. So they, they, they could get money, 
they could get stuff, they could get any, a promise to make repairs or, or keep their rent at a certain level for a certain amount of time, anything, right? That has changed now. There's only one compensation that you're able to receive for assigning your TOPO rights to a third party. That compensation is a 12 month ex extension of your lease at the same rental rate. So let's say you're, you're paying $2,000 a month. The only thing you're allowed to get in exchange for assigning your TOPO rights to somebody is for them to say, all right, once I buy the property, you get to stay there for an additional 12 months paying the same rent level. That's it. Uh, there either could happen, okay, but the, that's a, that, so that's a different, <laughs> different issue that we're talking about, and we'll talk about that, okay, we're going to get to that, but in terms of assigning your TOPO rights, I just want you all to be aware that that law has changed, you can't, you're not allowed to get money, right, it is important, you may not receive a consideration uh, to either transfer your rights or to vacate the unit prior to this 12 month period running out. So let's say uh, you, tr you assign your rights and I say to you, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy the building and in exchange I'm gonna let you stay there for another year for uh, that, you know, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not gonna change your rent level, right? You're gonna continue to pay 2,000 a month. And then three months in, once I've taken possession, own, ownership, I say, you know what, I changed my mind. I give you $10,000 and you leave now. That is a violation of this law. Okay? You can leave if you want. You don't have to. But that transaction is a violation of this law. And it's something that's specifically written into the law. Ah, uh, yeah. Can we talk about this offline? <laughs> yeah, ju just because it, it's going to sort of take us a little bit off topic. Uh, I, I, again, I think, you know, you ask all the right questions, uh, but in terms of the pros and cons, I mean, yeah, it, it limits tenants, right? It limits tenants. It, um, uh, it, 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 it takes away some of the things that they would have been able to get previously in terms of just being able to assign their rights and get money or whatever it is. One of the benefits is what used to happen before and what a lot of tenants uh, had an issue with was land, uh, owners or developers would come in and say, you know what, here's some money, give me your total rights and then leave, right? And what would happen? The tenant would leave, it would knock down the building, build up, build a condo building, raise the rents. Now we have reduced the level of affordable housing. So um, some say, not, I'm not endorsing this one or another, but some say that uh, these transactions were uh, leading to an erosion of affordable housing. And uh, some also say that these transactions were uh, taken advantage of tenants and that they were giving tenants a, a sort of temporary benefit and, and some financial compensation, but taking away their, their permanent rental housing rights, their affordability and that sort of thing. I hope that answers your question. But we can talk about it more in depth. Yes, ma'am. So, okay, so the question is, I mean, if I may paraphrase, it seems a little unfair if you've already been there, uh, now you change the law and you're not, you, you're taking a, uh, away our right to be able to transfer our TOPA rights and get whatever compensation we want. Sure. Somebody. Right. Yeah. So look, um, I, I think that's a very valid point. 
I think that's a point that I encourage you to make to the council. Uh, this is a new, sorry? Well, I mean, uh, look, this is, this is a new law, right? And, and the reason it's been changed is because there were, there were complaints made about the old law. Ma'am, if I may. So if you have issues with this law, I, I, I encourage you to participate in the same process that got the old law changed to this law, which is you go to the council, you go to the council hearings, you, you write to the council members, and you let them know uh, how you feel, and, and specifically just let them know about the, the, the things that have happened, the results of this law. We, you know, we gotta give it a little time and see, is it good, is it bad, right? Um, but if we feel that it's bad, we let them know, and hopefully they'll listen to us, and hopefully they'll make the changes. If we speak loud enough, and, and the numbers are big enough, they'll usually listen. Yes, sir? Yeah, it's still erosion on affordable housing. Is this thing going to do it? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Same thing. That's a fair point. Same outcome. But look, here's the thing. After the year runs out, it doesn't mean they can just automatically evict you. Right? So and we'll talk about that. Sorry? The process. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll get to that part. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, one other thing about assignments. Before, uh, this change in law, uh, you know, let's say you are, were a tenant and I'm a developer and I want to come get you topo rights. Like you could assign it to me and I could assign it to Tom and Tom could assign it to Kelly and, and, and so you could just go on and on. You know, that maybe he'll pay me some money and she'll pay him some money and so on and so forth. That law was also changed. You're not allowed to do that. Here's what you're allowed to do. Let's say I assign my rights to Tom he can assign them one more time, but only to a private or nonprofit corporation or partnership of which he himself is an owner, managing member, or officer. So essentially, if, you, if somebody assigns their total rights to you, you take them and then you say, you know what, I want to buy this building not in my own name, but in the name of a company, and the, I own the company, you can, you can make that additional assignment. But you can't just sort of play volleyball with somebody's topo rights. All right. Some other provisions. <sighs> topo offers prior to July 3rd. We get a lot of these questions, right? What happens if I got an offer of sale before July 3rd? So if that happened, your offer of sale falls under the prior topo law, which means that, uh, forget about what I just told you. If you live in a single family accommodation, you had Topo rights, they have to give you an offer of sale, all right? Um, if they did give you a, 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 an offer of sale prior to July 3rd, then you can write it on all the way to the end and go through the total process. If for some reason you're not able to buy it within that 180 day, uh, it's, it's called a start over period, six months after they send you the law, uh, the, uh, the, the offer of sale, the law says they have to start the process all over again, all right? So if you don't buy it, if nobody else buys it with, after that six month period, then the whole thing starts all over. And then they have to go with this new law now. But if you got an offer of sale prior to July 3rd, the previous law applies, okay? One other thing, 15 day rider first refusal, all right? That's your second bite at the apple. What I just talked about was the first bite at the apple. The, the owner has to send the notices out. The owner has to send out the offer of sale. You get to respond to the offer of sale. You get to negotiate. You get, you get to have your financing period. All that, that's part of your first bite at the apple. Let's say you go through that process and at any, any part of the process, you just don't go through the, with a purchase, right? And then, at some point, the owner enters into a contract with a third party you get a second bite at the apple. You get 15 days to match that third party contract. That's your right of first refusal, okay? So it's an additional safeguard to make sure that you still have the right to buy the property at whatever the market value is. Now, other tenant protections. This goes to the question that, that you were talking about, sir, which is, well, what happens after the one year period or what happens after this new person buys the property. Even if you don't have COPA rights, even if you are not able to buy the property, even, uh, even if you do have COPA rights but you don't 
you know, end up purchasing. You have all of the tenant protections that are afforded to you under the Rental Housing Act. So uh, the protection from being evicted, the, uh, if it's a rent control unit, the protection from having your rent be, be, you know, be raised more than a certain level. So all of those other rights you still have. And, and it's really important for us to understand that because just because your, your, your house is, the house where you're living is sold doesn't mean you have to leave. Doesn't mean they automatically come and you know, they can evict you or doesn't mean that they can automatically raise your rent. They, all, they have to go through certain processes and if you have any questions, if you have any doubt in your mind uh, as to whether what they're doing is legal or permissible under the law, I encourage you to come speak with us and we'll take you through the process and we'll, we'll let you know whether what they're doing is legitimate. Yes, ma'am. That's a little strange. So, um, yeah, so what Benita's re referencing was this. Uh, that there, is, uh, that there are 10 specific reasons in DC how, uh, how a tenant can be evicted, right? One of them is if either the owner of a property wants to move into the property for their own personal use and occupancy. The second one is if, uh, if I want to sell my property to somebody who wants to move in for his or her own personal use and occupancy. Okay, so if I do that, let's say I, you know, I sign a contract with Tom and I say, uh, you, Tom, you want to move in here for yourself? And he says, yes, I do. And I want to move in there um, as soon as I buy the property. So what I can then do as the still current owner, before I've sold it, and I give you a 90 day notice, 90 day notice to vacate for personal use and occupancy of the contract purchaser. Okay, I have to have a contract and the contract has to say he's going to move in when he buys it. If I do that, if I give you that notice after the 90 days, if you don't leave, I can initiate eviction proceedings against you. Now, if that's fraudulent, and if he just says he's going to move in, but he doesn't, and he goes and rents it out within 12 month period afterwards, we can get him for that. All right? So he's not going to get away with it if, he, you know, if he's trying to, uh, if he's acting fraudulently. But if he's acting legitimately, he's allowed to do that. The, the law does. Excuse me? You, you're not allowed to, uh, with, with, uh, within 12 months after you've evicted a tenant uh, for personal use and occupancy, you're not allowed to rent the property to somebody else. Yes, sir? How about on the 13th month? What's the time frame that? After 12 months, you can do it. Uh, after 12 months. Yes. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, let's wrap this up. We're going to do a quick case study before we get out of here. Uh, but Luther Landowns. Oh, is renting a single family home to, in Barry Farms to Mr. Ricky Renner. The property includes a detached carriage house in the backyard that is being rented separately to Mr. Other and Aunt and his mother-in-law. What are Luther's obligations under TOPA if he wants to sell the property? All right, so who are the players here? We've got Luther, we've got Ricky, we've got Other. And we've got the mother-in-law. Talk to me. Who gets what rights? What, what does Luther have to do? Okay, no. Sorry? Okay. okay, what about it? <laughs> yeah. Well, the first question is, does this fall under the uh, single family accommodation? No. 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 Catch. No, it does. Okay, let's take a poll. Hands up if you think it does. We got one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five-ish. Hands up if you think it does not fall under single family accommodation. Vote. Come on. Vote. It does, it, does. it does fall. This does fall under the definition of a single family accommodation. And, and, and this, this is why I did this, because this is one of those uh, tricky situations that actually do exist. We actually had one of these cases um, uh, at OTA where, where it was the same exact scenario. So uh, the, the tenant was living in the main, uh, ma main building, and there was a separate building with separate tenants, and 
they all were entitled to total rights or to, or to the initial uh, solicitation notice. So you said that three day or solicitation notice has to go send out to everyone. Absolutely. What else does a landlord have to do? Very farms. Yes. <laughs> Very farms in DC. Very southeast. Okay. What else? What else? Anything else? Any other notices? Any other? Anything else at the land? But that's not all the landlord's obligation. The landlord sends out forms one and three. Tenants send responses with the forms two and four. All right. So landlord sends response form one, and let's say, who, who do you think might respond with a form two? Ricky Renner. Do you think Ricky might respond with a form two? Claiming elderly or disability status? Yes. Maybe, yes. right? What about Mr. Enoch? Yes. Maybe, yes. maybe the mother-in-law, right? Depending on their age, yes. depending on their disability status. Okay, and then they would, have, if any of them claim elderly or disability status, then what does Luther have to do? No, no, no. Right now, they, they, he sent out that form one, and they, they, they sent back the form two claiming elderly or disability oh. status. So now what does Luther have to do, the landlord? What's, what's three? Form three is the offer of sale. Now the whole topa part starts, right? They get an offer of sale. And if they are eligible, they get... They, they get to respond with a statement of interest, they go through the negotiations period, and they go through the financing settlement period, you know, if they choose to purchase the property. All right? Guys, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for joining us. If you have any questions, please. Uh, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm gonna get to that. If you have any questions, please, uh, you know, you, you're welcome to come chat with me. Yes, you have a question now. What, what about Lucas? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what? That's a great question, guys. So, question to everyone. You've got one set of tenants living in the carriage house, and you've got another tenant living in the main house. Who gets the topo rights? Let's say they all are eligible. Both. Okay. So let's say they all get the TOPA rights, and let's say both of them respond with a statement of interest. What happens? So, I'm sorry. I the better one. The better one. Exactly. Exactly. The landlord gets to choose which offer to take. And if both offers are substantially similar or the same, the landlord just has to make a decision. If there, you know, if there's a reason, great. If there's not, then the landlord just has to pick. Yes. So if there are two separate, separate properties, mm -hmm. then do, do they have to apply for? They have to one they're in, or they have to apply for? No, no, it's not separate properties. They're all in, on one property. It's just two separate buildings on the same property, so they can't be subdivided. Cannot. The whole property, exactly. All right, so uh, our wonderful volunteer is going to now pull out a raffle ticket for this gift, which is a dining room dish set. And... Oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, do, do they all have Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. All right. So everyone has a survey. Everyone has a ticket. All right. Okay. No, 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 no. I'll hold it. You grab it. All right. All right. So the lucky number is 608-302. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. There you go. All right.
right, have a wonderful rest of uh, the summit, everyone. And again, if you've got any questions, please feel free to come up to any of us uh, and ask. Come to our office. We're happy to be there for you. At the reef center. Yes? Wait, give me a second. Let me just take this.